Chapter Sixteen of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Red and the Black, Volume One, by Stondahl. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Sixteen. The Day After. He turned his lips to hers, and with his hand, called back the tangles of her wandering hair. Don Juan. Chapter One, Stanza One Hundred and Seventy. Happily for Julien's fame, Madame de Renal had been too agitated, and too astonished, to appreciate the stupidity of the man, who had in a single moment become the whole world to her. Oh, my God, she said to herself, as she pressed him to retire, when she saw the dawn break. If my husband has heard the noise, I am lost. Julien, who had had the time to make up some phrases, remembered this one. Would you regret your life? Oh, very much, at a moment like this. But I should not regret having known you. Julien thought it incumbent on his dignity to go back to his room in broad daylight, and with deliberate imprudence. The continuous attention with which he kept on studying his slightest actions, with the absurd idea of appearing a man of experience, had only one advantage. When he saw Madame de Renal again at breakfast, his conduct was a masterpiece of prudence. As for her, she could not look at him without blushing up to the eyes, and could not live a moment without looking at him, she realized her own nervousness, and her efforts to hide it redoubled. Julien only lifted his eyes towards her once. At first, Madame de Renal admired his prudence. Soon, seeing that this single look was not repeated, she became alarmed. Could it be that he does not love me? she said to herself. Alas, I am quite old for him. I am ten years older than he is. As she passed from the dining-room to the garden, she pressed Julien's hand. In the surprise caused by so singular a mark of love, he regarded her with passion, for he had thought her very pretty over breakfast, and while keeping his eyes downcast, he had passed his time in thinking of the details of her charms. This look consoled Madame de Renal. It did not take away all her anxiety, but her anxiety tended to take away nearly completely, all her remorse towards her husband. The husband had noticed nothing at breakfast. It was not so with Madame d'Herville. She thought she saw Madame de Renal on the point of succumbing. During the whole day her bold and incisive friendship regaled her cousin with those innuendos which were intended to paint in hideous colours the dangers she was running. Madame de Renal was burning to find herself alone with Julien. She wished to ask him if he still loved her. In spite of the unalterable sweetness of her character, she was several times on the point of notifying her friend how officious she was. Madame Derville arranged things so adroitly that evening in the garden that she found herself placed between Madame de Renal and Julien. Madame de Renal, who had thought in her imagination how delicious it would be to press Julien's hand and carry it to her lips, was not able to address a single word to him. This hitch increased her agitation. She was devoured by one pang of remorse. She had so scolded Julien for his imprudence in coming to her room on the preceding night, that she trembled, lest he should not come to-night. She left the garden early, and went and ensconced herself in her room, but not being able to control her impatience, she went and glued her ear to Julien's door in spite of the uncertainty and passion which devoured her, she did not dare to enter. This action seemed to her the greatest possible meanness, for it forms the basis of a provincial proverb. The servants had not yet all gone to bed. Prudence at last compelled her to return to her room. Two hours of waiting were two centuries of torture. Julien was too faithful to what he called his duty to fail to accomplish stage by stage what he had mapped out for himself. As one o'clock struck, he escaped softly from his room, 
assured himself that the master of the house was soundly asleep, and appeared in Madame de Renal's room. Tonight he experienced more happiness by the side of his love, for he thought less constantly about the part he had to play. He had eyes to see and ears to hear. What Madame de Renal said to him about his age contributed to give him some assurance. Alas, I am ten years older than you. How can you love me? she repeated vaguely, because the idea oppressed her. Julien could not realize her happiness, but he saw that it was genuine, and he forgot almost entirely his own fear of being ridiculous. The foolish thought that he was regarded as an inferior, by reason of his obscure birth, disappeared also. As Julien's transports reassured his timid mistress, she regained a little of her happiness, and of her power to judge her lover. Happily he had not, on this occasion, that artificial air which had made the assignation of the previous night a triumph rather than a pleasure. If she had realized his concentration on playing a part, that melancholy discovery would have taken away all her happiness for ever. She could only have seen in it the result of the difference in their ages. Although Madame de Renal had never thought of the theories of love, difference in age is, next to difference in fortune, one of the great commonplaces of provincial witticisms whenever love is the topic of conversation. In a few days, Julien surrendered himself with all the ardour of his age, and was desperately in love. One must own, he said to himself, that she has an angelic kindness of soul, and no one in the world is prettier. He had almost completely given up playing a part. In a moment of abandon, he even confessed to her all his nervousness. This confidence raised the passion which he was inspiring to its zenith. And I have no lucky rival after all, said Madame de Renal to herself with delight. She ventured to question him on the portrait in which he used to be so interested. Julien swore to her that it was that of a man. When Madame de Renal had enough presence of mind left to reflect, she did not recover from her astonishment that so great a happiness could exist, and that she had never had anything of. Oh, she said to herself, if I had only known Julien ten years ago, when I was still considered pretty. Julien was far from having thoughts like these. His love was still akin to ambition. It was the joy of possessing, poor, unfortunate, and despised as he was, so beautiful a woman. His acts of devotion, and his ecstasies, at the sight of his mistress's charms, finished by reassuring her a little, with regard to the difference of age. If she had possessed a little of that knowledge of life, which the woman of thirty has enjoyed, in the more civilized of countries, for quite a long time, she would have trembled for the duration of a love, which only seemed to thrive on novelty, and the intoxication of a young man's vanity. In those moments, when he forgot his ambition, Julien admired ecstatically even the hats, and even the dresses of Madame de Renal. He could not sate himself with the pleasure of smelling their perfume. He would open her mirrored cupboard, and remain hours on end, admiring the beauty and the order of everything that he found there. His love leaned on him, and looked at him. He was looking at those jewels and those dresses, which had been her wedding presents. I might have married a man like that thought Madame de Renal sometimes. What a fiery soul! What a delightful life one would have had with him! As for Julien, he had never been so near to those terrible instruments of feminine artillery. It is impossible, he said to himself, for there to be anything more beautiful in Paris. He could find no flaw in his happiness. The sincere admiration and ecstasies of his mistress would frequently make him forget that silly pose which had rendered him so stiff and almost ridiculous during the first moments of the intrigue. There were moments where, in spite of his habitual hypocrisy, he found an extreme delight in confessing to this great lady who admired him his ignorance of a crowd of little usages. His mistress's rank seemed to lift him above himself. Madame de Renal, on her side, would find the sweetest thrill of intellectual voluptuousness in thus instructing in a number of little things 
this young man, who was so full of genius, and who was looked upon by every one as destined one day to go so far. Even the sub-prefect and M. Valenod could not help admiring him. She thought it made them less foolish. As for Madame Derville, she was very far from being in a position to express the same sentiments. Rendered desperate by what she thought she divined, and seeing that her good advice was becoming offensive to a woman who had literally lost her head, she left Vergy without giving the explanation which her friend carefully refrained from asking. Madame de Renal shed a few tears for her, and soon found her happiness greater than ever. As a result of her departure, she found herself alone with her lover nearly the whole day. Julien abandoned himself all the more to the delightful society of his sweetheart, since, whenever he was alone, Fouquet's fatal proposition still continued to agitate him. During the first days of his novel life, there were moments when the man who had never loved, who had never been loved by anyone, would find so delicious a pleasure in being sincere, that he was on the point of confessing to Madame de Renal that ambition which up to then had been the very essence of his existence. He would have liked to have been able to consult her on the strange temptation which Fouquet's offer held out to him, but a little episode rendered any frankness impossible. End of chapter 16